Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual presentation and conversation on social and racial justice initiatives at Macaulay Honors College. My name is Stephanie Hyacinth. I'm the Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations for Macaulay. Today's presentation and conversation will include an overview video on Macaulay that we use to recruit students. After the video, we'll follow up the presentation with our three justice initiatives that we're working on. Please note that the presentation is going to be recorded and that the audio and chat functions will be muted at this time. But at any time during the conversation, please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So now I'm pleased to introduce my three colleagues. Our Dean, Dr. Mary C. Pearl, our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Joseph Ugaritz, and our Vice President for External Relations, Jeffrey Glick. So let's get started. And thanks for coming. How will you change the world? Start at Macaulay Honors College. We're preparing future leaders for New York City, the country, and even the world. Macaulay Honors is a highly selective undergraduate community of high achieving students who embody the remarkable diversity of New York City. With an entering class of 520, more than half of our students proudly come from immigrant families. One in five are the very first in their families to attend college, and together they represent the top 4% of the 13,000 plus incoming freshmen from eight of CUNY's leading senior colleges. You will meet some of the most passionate, the brightest, the most driven uh, you know, students you will see, and they will almost force you to be the best you possible, and it's, it's the best thing about Macaulay. We provide students like Ahmed Farouk, who just finished his first year at Columbia Law with the individualized attention of a small liberal arts college, but we also draw on the extensive academic resources of the largest and best urban public university in the country, CUNY. When I was coming into college, I had a pretty set idea of what I wanted to do as a major. I definitely wanted to do biochemistry because those were the two classes I loved the most in high school. And it turns out that I no longer am a biochemistry major. I'm an accounting major now because at 18, even though you think you know what you want to do, it's, you know, it's a ball game. You have to play it out and see where you end up. A Macaulay Honors education begins with a sequence of four seminars in the liberal arts spread over the first two years. Capped at 20 students per section, the seminars incorporate primary research, classroom instruction, and an experiential immersion into the arts, the natural sciences, the people, and the public policies of New York City. Bright students like Kristen Cornane thrive in these challenging seminars and often discover new talents and passions. Our exceptional honor students attract top faculty members and distinguished visiting professors, like Nobel Prize winning oncologist Harold Varmus, former city councilman Eric Joya, and retired General David Petraeus. Macaulay students benefit from one of the best ratios of advisors to students anywhere. Our team of academic advisors work full time to ensure that every student get the support needed to achieve their very best. Macaulay, I was able to realize that people are here to support me. That's why they're here. And that really, you know, opened my eyes to, okay, even though these are high stakes as far as, you know, you really want to do well in schools, so you can get a job and thinking that far ahead, you have someone supporting you and you're not alone in this. Because I know that I have it in me, but having Macaulay back me up on that is really helpful. Macaulay is a place where you're going to learn to be a leader no matter what you do. I mean, you're kind of pushed into this and I think in the best way possible because Macaulay's really supported me emotionally, financially, um, you know, and socially, making sure that I have the tools to really just push through and succeed. Um, I've done a lot of internships because of the resources that Macaulay has given me. Um, I went abroad, I'm currently working at, you know, my dream architecture firm, and now I'm going into my fourth year um, out of five, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, exploring who I want to be as an architect. Outside the classroom, Macaulay students apply their ambition, engage their creativity, and test their leadership by participating in a wide range of clubs, service, and other extracurricular activities. When I was at Macaulay, I was the founder and the director for two years of the Macaulay Triplets, which is the only a cappella group at Macaulay. Uh, the Macaulay administration was a, incredibly supportive. They immediately jumped on the idea, said, sure, you know, organize it. Well, we can get you the space. Uh, we can provide you with some funding for things you want to do. We can help you organize the concerts. And I think without their help, it would have been a lot more difficult, if not impossible. Macaulay Honors was launched in 2001 
to attract the highest achieving students from diverse communities throughout New York City and provide them with the education and support needed to become our future civic, scientific, and business leaders. Through funding from New York State, our students receive a four-year merit scholarship that fully covers tuition. Philanthropic support raised by our foundation provides a wide range of academic enhancements and support, including opportunities fund grants that defray the costs of study abroad, fund research projects, and provide stipends for internships. This robust range of supports, combined with our rigorous academics and intensive advisement, has consistently earned Macaulay top ratings as one of the very best honors colleges in the nation. When applying to Macaulay Honors, students choose from one of eight home campuses spread across the five boroughs of New York, Baruch, City, Hunter, and John Jay, all in Manhattan, Lehman College in the Bronx, along with Brooklyn, Queens, and the College of Staten Island. Students take most of their classes on their home campuses, but as Macaulay Honors students, they get priority status to enroll in courses across the full CUNY system and exclusive access to advanced interdisciplinary seminars at the Macaulay Building on West 67th Street, right near Lincoln Center. At the Macaulay Building, our students come together, at least when there's not a global pandemic, to hear distinguished lectures, participate in student-led clubs, access wellness services, meet with career development counselors, and celebrate their many successes. And over 40% of our students pursue advanced degrees within two years of graduation, and they've won more than 250 prestigious awards from Rhodes, Goldwater, and Fulbright scholarships to Watson and National Science Foundation grants. For a small school that's graduated fewer than 20 classes, Macaulay has earned an outsized number of distinctions because we have such extraordinary students and we provided them with the resources and supports they need to thrive. Really pushed me towards um, not only applying for a Fulbright, but the field of international affairs. Before the Fulbright process, you have to uh, write a series of essays, uh, go through an interview. Thankfully for me, I had Macaulay advisors who were able to sit down with me and help me write my application and um, also just encourage me throughout the process. Inevitably, go on to, to win the Fulbright, so I'm grateful to Dr. Egan, Dr. Ronald, and uh, the Macaulay staff here. So I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Joe Ugaritz. I'm the Chief Academic Officer here at Macaulay. And if you'll give me just a minute to, uh, to start my screen share, I will talk to you about a, a new initiative that we're, we're just, uh, just beginning to launch, because we're just getting started. Um, this is a, a project that we're doing in, in partnership with Arizona State University's Barrett Honors College. About, uh, it's, it's actually about a year ago now, we had a, a visit and a conversation with, uh, with my counterpart at uh, Barrett. Uh, they had heard about our city seminars and our program for students and we're looking for ways that, that we could work together uh, across the country and across our, our geographic districts. We had some great ideas. We had some, some uh, good uh, possibilities for, for projects to work together on. Um, and, and then uh, 2020 happened. Uh, it it is, has been a year that's been really uh, kind of unusual, I could say, to, to put it uh, bluntly, um, it, or to put it uh, not so bluntly. It's been a year where, where things have gone in a lot of different directions that we didn't expect. Um, we've had some, uh, some evidence, some humorous evidence of ways that our, our plans and the reality of 2020 uh, were very different. Uh, we, we expected to be able to do things that we couldn't do. And things uh, you know, like, a, like a global pandemic and like a, a political uh, divisions and, and partisanship that seemed irreconcilable and, and a, a, a renewed and, in, and continued attention to issues of, of social justice and, and equity and, and racism and anti-racist work, including uh, police violence and, and other uh, really serious problems faced by, by our uh, Black and Indigenous communities. We really kind of had it all fall on top of us at the same time uh, at, in, the, in the spring semester of, of 2020. But as we began to, uh, to, to really understand what we were going through and sort of stop scrambling and start thinking, uh, both us at Macaulay 
and our, our uh, counterparts at, at Barrett Honors College uh, began to see two kind of threads in the response, uh, two ways in which the challenges of, of 2020 could actually be seen as, as inspirations or, or pathways to, to new achievement and, and to progress and growth. The, the first of those two ways was, was with our students. We, we knew that honor students were academically successful and had been able to do good work throughout their careers. But what we started to see in 2020 was a, a hunger among our students, a real desire and a strong motivation to have a, an effect on the world around them, to try to address these kinds of global and national and local uh, issues and, and challenges and to make their education relevant to issues of, of social justice uh, so that it was not just about them and their own success, but, a, but about improving the world around them. Combined with that hunger uh, among our students, we started to see as faculty that we, we all got thrown into teaching online all of a sudden and had to adapt to that um, really unexpectedly. But we also found that we had discovered ways in which teaching online could enable us to do things that we couldn't do otherwise. There were, there were problems, there were challenges, just like in the world around us, but in teaching online, there were also added advantages. There were ways that we could achieve classroom and, and pedagogical goals that were very difficult to achieve face-to-face -face and that working online became easier. Not least of those was the possibility to make connections among people who are intellectually connected uh, and, and have the same kinds of academic interests, but were geographically distributed or, or distant. So in putting those two things together, the, the hunger of our students for, for social justice and our own new expertise in working with, with online education, we developed a, a, a program that we call the Justice and Equity Honors Network. This is a, a cross-campus interdisciplinary honors certificate program that will allow students at both of our campuses to begin to apply what they, what they are learning as honor students to real world work and real world uh, solutions to the problems that they are so clearly aware of and so well equipped to, uh, to address. The, the program, the Justice and Equity Honors Network, we're calling it JEHN, the JEHN program includes some really important key features. First of all, we're creating a menu of online courses that specifically address issues of social justice. These classes will be selected from both our institutions, uh, from Arizona State and from the entire CUNY system. So two large public university systems with large numbers of faculty and centers and departments working in these areas. We will select courses from those from the two campuses and allow students to take, uh, take a selection from each of them. We're also gonna include peer mentorship. Uh, we've discovered that teaching to learn is a way that students can really increase not just their engagement with the subject matter, but the social connections that are, are so important to, to real learning. We'll have some apprenticeship programs for students to complete uh, internships and work opportunities with local and national uh, and even global uh, organizations and nonprofits that work uh, to defeat issues of, of inequity and social justice and, and racism and racist violence. We're also gonna create an online network and platform for the students to communicate with each other, to share ideas, to work on independent projects and to make social, social media, sounds like a bad word these days, but social media connections that are founded on real commitments to real work. Ideally, eventually, we, we hope sooner rather than later, we would also expect students to attend an in-person conference because working online has advantages, but it's not enough. And we want students to be able to come together in person to connect informally and socially in conversations and late night discussions, as well as doing community service work in, in various communities across the country. We'll also include faculty convenings and professional development because it's not enough to just teach classes to these honor students. Everyone who's taught them learns that they teach us as much about our teaching as, as we have to teach them about the subject matter. 
So we want this to be an opportunity for faculty uh, to also gain credentials and expertise. We'll invite guest speakers from, from various uh, parts of, of, the, uh, of the country and of the community uh, that's working on these kinds of issues. And we'll have for students a public facing final project, a capstone or thesis project that doesn't just sit in a drawer in a filing cabinet somewhere, but is available as part of the larger national conversation so that our students can do the research and do the work that then becomes available to the, to the community at large. Those are the key features, but there's one last one that, that is really critical, last but not least, and that's a, a credential for graduates, a certification that they can take with them when they leave Macaulay or Barrett and when they enter the, their careers, their graduate school uh, courses, wherever they're gonna go, they're gonna have this credential that demonstrates that they have expertise and interest and motivation to not just be sort of isolated academics, but to be fully engaged with, uh, with the issues in their world. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm so excited about this uh, academic program uh, that we are, are putting together with great enthusiasm and excitement with two very different urban public university campuses. I'd like to talk now about what we call our Bridge Scholars Transfer Program, and this is all about access uh, to honors public education. Um, it provides, uh, the Bridge Scholars Program provides a pathway for high achieving community college students in the CUNY system. They're mostly from underrepresented communities because that's the nature of our population uh, to complete their bachelor's degrees at Macaulay Honors College. Um, for Macaulay, a problem we've had in the past, frankly, is a reliance on SAT scores as a key factor in admissions. And that's made it difficult to recruit a stu student body that reflects the racial diversity of New York City. So, um, in underrepresented groups, in this case, primarily Black and Latinx students, make up less than 20% of Macaulay's total enrollment, which really stands in contrast to the approximately 55%, over half of all students um, uh, matriculated un at undergraduate degree programs across CUNY. And um, it's really uh, frustrating because this high threshold that SAT and ACT scores uh, present it's um, just uh, it doesn't help us. I mean, our, we would prefer the flexibility to make admissions decisions without giving absolute weight to a standardized test score. Um, we actually did a study, oh, well over five years ago where we demonstrated that um, there was absolutely no correlation with performance in college uh, related to SATs and ACTs. Um, and uh, only a month later, the uh, college board itself came out and, and revealed that uh, the, every single um, uh, part of that test is correlated with family income. And uh, so uh, the problem we have, though, is that admissions decisions are made directly by our eight consortial campuses. Um, and those are the campuses that share our students. And those campuses face significant internal and external pressures to maintain these high average SAT scores uh, for the Macaulay program. It makes their overall incoming class look very fancy to US News and World Report, you know, for example. So um, we wanted to solve both problems. The SAT ACT score becomes irrelevant when you accept students as transfers because they've already maintained a high um, a GPA in college. So uh, there's no predicting involved, they're performing. So the first iteration that we did of the transfer program tar targeted students who were successful in their initial college courses. And so we could broaden our selection criteria and still maintain our very high expectations for excellence. And our pilot program was funded by private dollars um, from the Carol and Milton Petrie and the Andrew Mellon Foundations. Uh, maybe uh, Joe, you can talk a little about this uh, pilot. Sure, Mary, I'm happy to pick up there. Uh, for that initial pilot, Macaulay chose uh, Bronx Community College and the Borough of Manhattan Community College as our initial partners, uh, starting with Bronx Community. Uh, together, these two community colleges have a, a, approximately 96% of the students are, are Black or Latinx. In 2017, we recruited our, our first cohort 
of uh, 18 students from uh, Bronx community and Borough Manhattan Community Colleges and offer them the opportunity to uh, join as Macaulay Honor students at Lehman College, our, our senior partner for that pilot. The students that uh, we selected for this program met some very stringent application criteria from, from their community colleges, including a, a 3.3 minimum GPA and personal statements and interviews. And we found that uh, selecting these students was, was uh, really successful. Um, that 3.3 minimum GPA was absolutely exceeded by the applicants who we accepted. In fact, uh, several of them are, are near to graduating at this point. We'll be graduating this spring uh, with, with 4.0 GPAs at the senior college level. Uh, after, after completing that first year of community college, all the students participate in an intensive summer program that includes our first two required honor seminars. Uh, so, <clears throat> pardon me, that way they lose no ground. They are at the same uh, pace and completing the, the same classes as their colleagues in Macaulay Honors who came in through our original uh, admissions methods. Uh, then they finished their community college studies in the fall and spring of their second year, transferred directly over as Macaulay Juniors at the start of their third year. Now, we uh, had some expectations of barriers that these students would face. We, we knew they were ambitious and hardworking. What we found was that the actual barriers they faced were really systemic and, and economic, not academic. Uh, unlike the more traditional Macaulay students, the Bridge Scholars often had complicating demands such as the childcare, employment responsibilities, or in increased travel time because their classes were split between campuses that are separated sometimes by an hour or more commute. Again, this is in pre-pandemic times when we were commuting. But because we were able to provide the support such as cash stipends during the summer and unlimited Metro cards, uh, for their, for their travel between campuses, they were able to pass up or forego summer employment and focus on their academic work and travel safely and quickly to class. By the end of the second year, they all received their associate's degrees and 78% of them seamlessly transferred to Macaulay at Lehman College, where, as I said, they achieved academic results comparable or, or sometimes better uh, to those of some students directly admitted to Macaulay. Of the four students who did not uh, complete the transfer to, to Lehman, one ended up transferring to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and two chose to go to other CUNY campuses, Hunter and Brooklyn. The only one student uh, actually withdrew from the program due to a family emergency, and uh, we, we do hope that she will be continuing. She's on leave right now, so that that 78% number may go even higher. Uh, and maybe Stephanie can talk now about uh, further information and next steps. Thank you so much, Joe. So prior to, as Mary said, prior to the Bridge Scholars Program, the highest achieving community college students at CUNY uh, were routinely transferred into top private schools, um, but wouldn't be considered by Macaulay. So phase one of the project demonstrated, you know, not only that uh, top community college students deserved a place at Macaulay, but that they belong at Macaulay. And it wasn't so much about a diversity number as much as how much they enhanced our community of scholars. So to, to further build on the model, uh, we are now in phase two of our pilot and with funding from the GS Humane Corps, we are launching a second cohort with the College of Staten Island. And this is where we will have the community college and the four-year program uh, on the common campus. And what does this mean for us budget-wise? Well, the private funds go for expenses like personnel, so our seminar faculty, our technologists, our transfer advisors, so that that seamless pathway does um, give those students an opportunity to have a point person for any issues they may have. Um, funds for opportunities, for opportunities funds for experiential learning, uh, also funding for our course seminar enrichments and other student success, um, as well as our laptops. So we are now actively looking for cohort three, which we imagine will be again with Borough of Manhattan Community College, as well as one of our senior colleges. And as we continue to improve and refine and document our pilot, 
our future plan is to incorporate the transfer program as an integral part of the Macaulay Honors College program and put that onto our operating budget that is publicly funded. I want to close with a really great um, comment that we have from one of our first uh, cohort students. And in fact, I think he's graduating early. He says, CUNY loses bright and hardworking community college educated students every year to other prestigious colleges because a reporting path like the Macaulay Bridge Scholars Program was not offered to them. He said, I know this to be true because these students are my friends. They were my study buddies, my coworkers and my classmates. Jeffrey, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, that's that's really a perfect segue since you know Joe started by talking about one of our new academic programs that's focused on this notion of building a more inclusive, just environment. And the Bridge Transfer Program kind of straddles both an academic and in some respects a recruitment program. Um, the Bridge Transfer Program has demonstrated that there are really outstanding high achieving students at the community college level that, that never even knew about Macaulay Honors College when they were applying. And had they known about Macaulay, they almost certainly would have applied and I'm sure they would have been accepted. So one of the, one of the other initiatives that we're undertaking right now is a, a reboot of how we are doing our outreach to students throughout New York City, especially how we go about identifying high achieving underrepresented minority candidates to apply to Macaulay, specifically looking at the, the Black and the Latinx populations um, that, that aren't hearing about Macaulay through, for example, the guidance counselors at their schools. You know, we're a, we're a small operation. Our, our enrollment management team is only about three people um, that are actually making site visits. So we've begun to look at more innovative ways in broadening our reach to schools throughout not just New York City, but more broadly, New York State and, and the, the larger area. Um, one of the things that we're, we're beginning to do is experiment using social media and actually using, using paid ads to um, reach out to students that wouldn't have heard about us otherwise. Um, this has been a, a very effective way for us to expand our footprint with a very small investment. Uh, last year, we invested, I think, about $5,000 in a social media ad buy. Um, we resulted in having the largest pool of applicants that we've had really ever in the history of Macaulay. Now, I'm, I'm not going to credit that solely to our social media campaign. You know, a lot of this is uh, Macaulay has a growing reputation as really one of the nation's top honors college programs. And that is, of course, bringing more students to us. But we're trying to find ways that we can really proactively identify promising young high school students that are coming from communities that, that wouldn't be hearing about Macaulay because of their guidance counselor programs, for example. You know, an interesting fact is that uh, for the, the current class we have at Macaulay, 70% of our students are coming from schools where we only accepted one or two students total. Um, so we have 70% of our students come from over 280 different schools around New York City. Um, and they're, they're community schools, they're schools out, outside of the city. We have, we have schools in parts of upstate. Um, we're looking for ways that we can do a better job of, of reaching out to them. So social media and, and really a more creative use of, um, of marketing our program is one of the things we're doing. The other thing that we're doing though is that we're partnering with our, um, our networks of students and parents that know about Macaulay because we found that historically uh, the way many of our incoming students have heard about Macaulay is word of mouth. They've heard from the friends of the parent, from uh, a, 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 the sibling of a, of a classmate of theirs. Um, and we're now actually partnering with student groups. So our, uh, our student group Macaulay Diversity Initiative has offered to uh, actually talk with guidance counselors or student groups and schools that are interested in hearing about what it's like to be a student of color at Macaulay. Um, we've, we've just launched this initiative where uh, we worked with Macaulay Diversity Initiative to reach out to 5,000 guidance counselors in our network. Um, and we're beginning to, to, to pair them up on individual visits. These are some of the things that we're starting to do. Um, and of course, you know, one of our constraints is just the, the limited staffing and the budget we have to do this, but we're encouraged by the, uh, the initial results and um, we're determined to continue to build on that early vision of Macaulay as um, a diverse community that's providing top honors uh, college experience for New York and beyond. 
Thanks so much, Jeffrey. So we had a couple of questions that came in beforehand. Um, and I see that there's one also uh, here. And it says, um, so how did the Bridge Scholars interact with your core student population? Uh, so we really made a, a, a strong effort to make sure that these students were part of the Macaulay cohort, that they weren't uh, in some kind of a small or segregated outside group. They shared the advisor and the events that the other students shared, and we made sure that they were able to take part in all of our kind of large scale interactive academic events like our, our bio blitz and our STEAM festival and the things that all students do together. So they had an identity as a cohort of bridge scholars, but they also knew from the start that they were gonna be part of the, uh, of the Macaulay team, the Macaulay family. The other uh, important element of this was that we, um, had peer mentors from the, the traditional Macaulay class who were assigned to, uh, you know, kind of be guides and, and helpers uh, to the bridge scholars so that they kind of made a, a friendly connection that was not someone who was uh, above them or in authority over them, but someone who had just been there before and, and could understand what they were going through and, and help them over the sometimes uh, you know, kind of complicated bureaucratic struggles that are, are part of being a CUNY student. I'd like to add one more thing, which is that it's not a, trans, a traditional transfer program in that the students do two years at the community college graduate and then become fully fledged Macaulay students starting with their junior year. No, we started talking to students in the fall of their first year of community college. And by the middle of their second semester, they were provisionally accepted as Macaulay students so that um, at that point they, they, they got to know the Macaulay family and started being invited to events. And so over the summer, they were taking the Macaulay seminar. So even though they uh, remained uh, to get their associate's degrees, they kind of had a hybrid identity, uh, much as our more traditional students have of being say a BMCC student and a Macaulay student at the same time during their second year. So it really was much more of a, um, uh, of a pathway that um, engaged them from the very outset. So we have another question. Uh, this question is, will the Justice and Equity Honors Network include other honors colleges beyond Macaulay and ASU? Yes, that's uh, absolutely part of the plan. The, uh, the initial step is to build as a partnership between the, the two institutions that are kind of developing the idea. But once we have this up and running, we have written into the, uh, the memorandum of understanding uh, a, a pathway to invite other honors colleges to join in. Ideally, we'd, we'd like to build uh, from different sort of geographical and cultural regions of, across the United States. Uh, taking uh, honor students at public honors colleges in all different regions. Because we, we do find that our students uh, often study abroad, but they often have uh, very little interaction with, with uh, Americans from other parts of, of, the, uh, of the country. And that it's really uh, fun and, and intellectually uh, stimulating for them to make those connections with people whose interests are in, in some ways the same, but whose uh, culture, I mean, this, this country does have different kind of geographic cultures that, uh, that our students find endlessly uh, diverting and interesting. Thank you, Joe. Um, another question is, oh, this is a good one. What has the, uh, what impact has the pandemic had on your student, on your student experience? Oh, that is a good question. And um, uh, of course, uh, Joe alluded to the, the, the uh, some of the, the differences that might be negative. Um, one competitive advantage we had at, at Macaulay is um, we knew coming in that uh, over 40% of our students do not have regular access to their own computers. So we give every incoming student, Bridge Scholars, as well as our traditional students, a laptop computer and associated software and orientation in their use. This is pre-pandemic. So at the time of the pandemic and lockdown, um, we, all, we had all the hardware and software in place. We also, as a matter of uh, course, have had over the last decade, uh, digital technology fellows, we now call them teaching and learning collaborators, which are graduate students who are 
much more than TAs. They, they really help uh, our faculty uh, deliver uh, courses in multiple modalities. So even for faculty members uh, for our Macaulay seminars who might not be comfortable online, they had an excited and willing and enterprising uh, assistant to help uh, make the transition smooth. So I think we did better than most. I mean, we all love the magic of the classroom, um, but uh, we were able to make the most of that. And then uh, we also, um, you know, this is such a troubling time. Um, and as um, I believe um, Stephanie said at the outset, uh, more than half of our students are um, immigrants or, or children of immigrants. And so um, the demonization of immigrants, the tensions associated with um, uh, political events, and then the Black Lives Matter um, issues all have created a kind of a, a pool of anxiety, even in the absence of COVID-19, but with the isolation, it's even stronger. And we really built up our wellness team. Um, again, we have foundation support that enables us uh, to do this. Um, we had uh, the head of our, our counseling, in fact, had a, a, back, a professional background in online counseling. So we stepped that up. Um, and then over the summer, um, I, I'd like Joe just to talk about how hard we work with our faculty to make sure that our, our fall, fall courses uh, were more than just making do, but really exciting. And, and, we've, and, and the, the academic team has done that in a myriad ways. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, the, this is something where, you know, we really, like I said, got thrown into a, a new situation in last spring. Um, Last spring in, in New York City and, and in, in Macaulay was a, a very difficult time. And we had students who, uh, who had family members who were sick and who lost family members and, and were under enormous stress as we all were. One of the things we heard repeatedly from students was that having classwork go on and having the opportunity to interact with their professors and their classmates in some semblance of normalcy was something that they were really able to hang on to so that our, our classes became the thing in their life that was okay. Uh, even though it was over Zoom, it was the thing that was still working and that they could still kind of uh, depend on. And we really, uh, as Mary said, have work, worked with the faculty over the summer to implement some of the lessons learned in the spring so that our, our fall classes this year we're able to, at least to a large degree, replicate the in-person experience. We had uh, our Arts in New York seminar, which normally involves uh, trips to performances and, and museums and galleries throughout the city. Obviously, we couldn't do that this fall, but instead we arranged artist visits and, and studio tour, virtual studio tours, so that the artist would take students through their studio and really get to see them at work. Uh, in a way that they probably couldn't have with just a museum visit. Uh, and we had performances uh, that we were able to schedule that were uh, custom made for, for our students and, and for our classes. Uh, in addition, Mary mentioned our, our TLCs, our teaching and learning collaborators. They spent their summer uh, working out ways to work with faculty to make sure that the, that the experience that students had was going to be as near to equivalent as we could make it. Uh, you've probably heard stories about students, uh, you know, c complaining about their college experience being ruined by the pandemic, and, and it certainly had an effect, but we like to think that we gave our students still a, a positive experience, even if it wasn't what they initially expected. Thanks, Joe. So before we wrap up, we have just two more questions. And um, one is, um, do you anticipate that the Justice and Equity Honors Network will include visiting faculty members when we're able to connect again in person? Yes, we really hope to be able to do that. Uh, we'd, we'd, we'd love to have uh, people come to our to our in-person events uh, and, and to have faculty. Right, right now, we're thinking of using classes that already exist and certifying them for inclusion in the network. But our, our ideal pathway to the future is to have classes specifically developed uh, for the Justice and Equity Honors Network. Um, that, that may be able to start even before we can start getting together in person, but of course, everything will be easier then. Excellent. And then the, the last question is, um, how many students from Macaulay and ASU do you expect to participate in this uh, certificate program? 
Sorry, I just muted myself when I thought I was unmuting myself. Uh, that seems to be another 2020 uh, habit. Uh, we expect to start, well, we're, we're predicting an initial cohort of 20 students from each, uh, from each institution. Um, we're writing into the plans uh, scalability so that if we get more interest than we expect in the first year, we will be ready to respond quickly. Uh, we want to be selective and get students who are truly committed and who will succeed. But we also want to be open and not turn away students who have a, a sincere desire. So our, our initial cohort is planned to be a total of 40 students, uh, but that is adjustable uh, if, if we get the interest. Terrific. Thank you so much, Joe. Well, um, this is going to conclude our program today. I want to thank everyone for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Take care.